day, depending on what we want to do today. But thank you for agreeing to sit down with us and let others share in your life story. And the whole purpose is for the HKL for you. Our family series is to help build up others and for us to learn from one another with our stories. So let me just start by thinking about this question. Would it be an understatement to say about your life that you've lived a full life? It would be an understatement. Yeah, how because so? Because I have lived a full, and I'm still living a full life, so I ha- I'm enjoying my life to the fullest. You look like you're about 30 years old. How old are you? Ooh, um, just say I'm over the, the limit. Uh, over, uh, I'll say I'm 73. All right. You look gorgeous <laughs> for 73. So knowing that you're this age now, what would you say with some words of advice you'd say to that younger teenage Faye, knowing what you know now at 73? I would tell a young person what you do when you are young, what you eat. It will tell on you as you get older. So eat healthy, be healthy, take care of yourself, take care of your body. That's good. So young Faye would be told to be very cautious about taking care of her body. Any other words of advice as a teenager talking to young Faye? What would you think to tell her? Anything about beyond her health, about how she thinks, how she moves, what she plans for her future, anything like that? Oh, well, enjoy your Enjoy yourself. Enjoy your life. You know, uh, nothing is wrong. Uh, you go out and you try. If you don't like it, then you keep moving until you figure out what you want in life. Because young people, they really don't know what they really want. So I just advise people to say, just go out and try different things until you find your niche or what you want to do. So interesting enough, you you kind of married young. How old were you when you got married? 20. 20. Yes. So on a reflection of that, would you still unadvise people at 20 to get married? No way. Would well, not tell anybody at age 20 to get married. So give us some feedback. What would you think? What what would you tell them as far as the things to think about before you at 20 before you just get married? I would say think about what you want to do in life because once you are committed in marriage, uh, you be committed to that marriage. But if you go out now while you're young, do not get married at 20. Do, do what you want to do now and, and find out the things that you want to do because once you get married, it's a commitment. So to two people, now it's only one, so it's you. So just hang in there, go out, and try and experiment everything. So now that you're at this season of your life, what things would you have loved to explore when you were a lot younger that now you're starting to do later in your life? Some things that you like to explore. Well, uh, really, I wanted to to explore. Well, it was not much that I wanted to explore. Well, traveling is one thing. I always wanted to travel. And I always said once I retire, that was going to be one of my main goals is to travel. So I'm basically trying to do that now. So interesting. Exploring. Did you work uh, when you were younger? I did. I did all kinds of work because my mom had us doing different types of jobs. And I was glad that she made us do that, that because it let me know what things that I didn't like. And what I wanted to do as I moved up into a, my career. Because uh, we, I babysitted, did not like it. <laughs> I cleaned house, did not like it. <laughs> so I always said I did not want to do those things because I have already done them. So you can say if you've done those things, then you can scratch them off. Because that way you know what you like and what you don't like. So, right. so what job or career did you end up having that you retired uh, from? Well, I started out in the federal, well, I started out in private industry, uh, working in Washington, D.C., a private company there. For, and I stayed there for five years. I got that job after, well, I had the job when I was in high school, my last year. And so my Uncle B was always on my case about coming into the government. So mm-hmm. after five years, 
I saw an ad in the Washington Post for SSA to come and work. So what I is like, SSA? Social Security Administration. Mm -hmm. So I decided that, oh, let me just go put my application in. I had already had my exam. I passed my clerical part as typing, and I did my shorthand. So I got accepted, took the exam, and got accepted and started my career in 1972 in the government. What was the scariest part about going into a government job coming from private industry? What was, what was scary about that? Uh, the unknowns. I didn't know what to expect by being in the government. Uh, I knew I could work. I knew I had good work ethic. So it really was just a new, a, a new window for me. So. How many years did you stay there until you retired? I stayed with Social Security. I retired there in, in 34 years. Did you experience any kind of racism or anything going on when you were coming in? Oh, yes. We had all sorts of racism. I mean, it was, um, for one thing, for Social Security, I can say that what they did that we didn't understand, or a lot of us didn't understand at first, was they had overtime. So they based us with the overtime, so people got used to working at overtime, so they didn't want to... Uh, uh, you know, move up or anything. But then I realized I was getting close to retirement that I'm, okay, I need promotions. Mm. So that's when I started to do my application and uh, put in for other job, even though we had the overtime. But then once the overtime stopped, then other people, you know, we realized then that we had to do other things besides just trying to depend on overtime. When you think about your time, how many years did you... Were you in the government before you retired? I retired uh, 34 years. 34? That's a lot. It was. But it was good years. Good and I years. had some good... I mean, the promotions were far and few. Um, but that's one thing I didn't like, but I didn't know. I knew I had had a job. I had to take care of my family. So that was the most important. So that's why I stayed. But uh, in the last... Ten years before I retired, I got a, a promotion to 9, 11, 12. And so that was good because um, there weren't many people in that field as of color. Me coming from the, the clerical field. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of hard because here, this is where you meet discrimination. Mm -hmm. You didn't have people willing to, to train you. You know, even though I was in a training position, but there was no one there. They said they're supposed to train you, but there was no one that willing to train me. Really? They had other folks that came in that didn't have any experience either in that job as a program analyst. And they worked with that person and trained them. But for me, I was out there on my own. I heard few people would, you know, give me suggestions, ideas, but uh, I basically... Had, was out there on my own. And I think they, because I came from the clerical field, I felt like they put you there to fail. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I had applied for that job mm, about six months. And I knew that that was a job that God sent me there. And mm -hmm. so I knew that uh, he wasn't going to leave me just there. And so I, I kept the faith. I came to work every day. I went to lunch there. I got back on time. I was just doing what I was supposed to do as far as an employee, and I stayed there and made the best of it. So after 30 plus years, when it was coming time for your retirement, you still probably felt like you were pretty young. Did you think that you were prepared for retirement? Uh, yes, I was prepared for retirement because um, I had gotten some, some money and I said, I'm going to put this, pay off all my bills. And so about five or six years, uh, I just paid off everything and I was ready to go. Once they told me how much my check going to be a month, I could make it. So that's what I did. So now, what's, I, <laughs> what surprised you when you actually got out in retirement? What kind of things surprised you being retired? Nothing surprised me. I just felt like I had worked so long and so hard. So I was ready to enjoy life because I put my life on hold for my kids, you know, for my two daughters. And so once I got them through college and they got on, they got their jobs and things, 
So I, retirement was just easy for me. I mean, I felt like I deserve it, I've earned it, and I'm going to enjoy it. So you use the word, you put your life on hold, so you've retired. Um, did you give yourself some months before you did anything, or did you get a second job, or you just played? What did you think you were doing since your life is no longer on hold? I gave myself three years after I retired just to do nothing, just to get used to not getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, preparing for work. I promised myself that I was going to stay in bed and get me eight hours of sleep. That was my first goal that I was going to do. And that's what I did for, it took me about three months to get used to getting eight hours of sleep. Mm. Straight. So, but I did it. Wow. It's a big adjustment. Now you you shared with us uh, off camera that you, You've actually had a couple of scary um, medical situations in your life, in your early life and in as you got in your midlife. Um, can you share the one, the first one is about the um, emergency you had as a female um, with a pregnancy. Can you share what happened there? Uh, I don't know. I guess I had my tube size and I got pregnant. So that was the scary part right there. But then I was, my mom always told me God wasn't finished with you having babies. So I figure, you know what? Moms know what they talking about. So you got to listen to them <laughs> because she told me when I got my tooth tied that God wasn't finished with me having babies. And all I could think about when I was in the emergency room, what my mama was saying, she said, God wasn't finished with you having children. So that that's one that was a, a lesson learned. So I think because I know what you're talking about, others may not understand. You had your tubes tied after having two children, mm -hmm. but then you had an atopic pregnancy, which is getting pregnant in your fallopian tube that right. were tied. Mm -hmm. So because of that, you experienced um, something that they thought you were possibly going to die at that time, right? Mm -hmm. Because of what was going on. No, I didn't think I was going to die. No, it was just something scary. Scary, scary. Yeah. And then fast forward in your life, what happened when you found out, uh, take us through what happened when you found out that you uh, had another medical scare and what was that scare? Um, uh, my second medical scare was my breast cancer. I was diagnosed in 1999. How did you find out? I mean, what was going on that you um, even thought something was going on? I didn't find out I, the year before I was you know, going through the menopause. So I was having these hot flights. They weren't bad, but I said, oh, let me just try this uh, medicine, you know. So I went there and doc, my GYN gave me some homo medicine uh, for my uh, hot flashes. And then the next year I went there. That following year, I went back to get my mammogram done, and that's when they found out I had breast cancer. Mm. So I think that. Mm -hmm. So what happened once you find out that you are diagnosed with breast cancer? Um, I stopped taking the uh, pills and I felt bad at first, but here again, I went back to what I, I grew up with, what my mom and my grandma would tell us, God's not going to put nothing on you that too much that you can't bear. And so I had to say to myself, uh, this too would pass, and I just kind of dealt with it. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize that I had breast cancer because I still was busy. I, I did what, I didn't sit there and say, why me? I, well, I did in my mind, but I knew that maybe uh, this would be an example for some, other, for some other young person. And so I just felt like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat this. I'm going to make it through. Uh, and I did. Uh, I had surgery in 2000, April of 2000. Um, I was blessed because I didn't have to have chemo. I didn't have to have radi radiation. Oh, how did so, that happen? When you say, because we're just learning about mm -hmm. this. Um, so you find out you have the diagnosis and then you say you have a surgery mm -hmm. and you don't have to have chemo and radiation. Walk us through what you're saying there. Cause we're not, uh, because, um, first of all, I've had, mammograms since I was 27 because of my grandma. My grandmother had breast cancer. And so at that time they were saying anybody who had family members, no matter how, what age you are, that you could 
get a, a mammogram. So I was 27 years old when I first got my first mammogram. So through those years, I always had my mammogram and they came, they were always positive. And then that last year, they could see there was some adjustment. So that's when they found out that I had the breast cancer. But you didn't have to take chemo or radiation nope. wise because of the mammograms? Because of it was caught in time. It was caught early. Oh, caught okay. early. Caught gotcha, early. gotcha. Yeah. And then they had films to, to go back and check to see the difference between from 27 years up until 50. So they had lots of films to say, you know, all these years, this is what her breast looked like now at this time. So they knew there was something going on. And so you had surgery. Mm hmm Surgery I, meaning what? what? I had a complete uh, mastectomy uh, in my left breast. Okay. And that was completely taken off. Okay. You went through the whole re reconstruction yeah. in that phase? I did, did you... it all in one thing. One, one shot. Had it taken off, surgery, put back on, all in one time. Now you have, you have this reflection now years after. Do you think you would have benefited from some kind of counseling or did you go through counseling or any kind? Or you just, you just marshaled through with your mother's mantra, your grandmother's mantra. Did you get any counseling? No counseling. I didn't need any counseling. I just knew maybe it was just meant for me. So I dealt with it. And then I would always say that I was going to tell everybody about breast cancer because when I was going through it, I didn't know anyone who had who had breast cancer no one told me and then after the fact that I had breast cancer and I was speaking out about it and then that's when a lot of women came to me and said well you know I had breast cancer I'm like for real you didn't say anything and no one said anything the whole time that I was in my breast cancer stage until afterwards I started speaking up and then women was coming to me and telling me that they had breast cancer so I promised myself that if I got a chance, I was going to tell everybody that I had breast cancer. And, you know, to this day, people said, I don't think, I don't remember you having breast cancer. I worked. Mm -hmm. I went to work every day after I had my mastectomy. And, you know, I just kept moving because I knew I wanted to live and I had things that I had to do. So I kept it moving. And, and the lack of knowledge was within your family, friends, and, and people just did not know because like, you just, like you said, kept moving. Mm -hmm. Now, you do have two adult daughters. Um, what's been the most uh, interesting thing about having two adult daughters and now having grandchildren? What have you learned from that experience in your journey? Dad came into your life at the age of 13 years old. How did, uh -huh. that, how did that come about? Uh, I guess I was just, she was visiting and my grandmother told me that was with your dad. So I was like, okay. And, and, yeah. and he just came into your life that way? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's how he came. Yeah. That's what my grandma would say. My grandma told me, oh, this is your dad right over here. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. How did that influence you as age of 13, you know, having that be announced that that was your father? I mean. It didn't bother me because, like I said, I was old enough to know. All right. Okay. You know, back in the day, people would say, well, you know, you ain't got no dad. I'm like, what? Well, I know I got a dad. I ain't, my mom couldn't make this baby back to make, make me come in this world by yourself. You know how people talk. Yeah. But, yeah. And your mom, she was okay with your grandmother telling you that was your father? Or? I don't think we, I, we ever said anything to my mom because, you know, she never said, to this day has now, you know, never told us who our dad was. She really had, she really didn't say anything about our dad. I don't know why she didn't. She really, to, I mean, even to date to her and her grave, she never said who our dad really was. Not to any of us. I mean, not to me. I didn't know. And I don't think Alice knew. I don't know if, if Bud knew. So I don't know. Hmm. But I don't know why. Don't ask me. You know, back in the day, they were hush-hush people back in the day. So. I was like, I don't know. My mama didn't ever say anything. I just saw my mama struggling. So. Hmm. You know?
curiosity or some such? You ever have curiosity? Because I'm, I'm guessing you do know your side, your father's side of the family more, right? I don't know anything about my dad. Nothing. I don't have, no, nothing. I know nothing about him at all. Nothing at all. Even at, you, at, come, him coming into your life at 13, you have no recollection, no type of hint of his family side at all? No. Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. Wow. Um. Yeah. Because the fact is, like I said, my mom never, t my, my, my mom never talked to us about it. We just knew. I remember we was at, at my grandmother's house and then he, he came by and she said, well, you know, this is your dad. My grandmother said that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, okay. And then, you know, we would see him around, but he never said, you know, we was his children or anything like that. So, I don't know. Mm. Other people would tell us that, so. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I always tell people. I said I knew I had a daddy somewhere, but it didn't bother me, really, to tell you the truth, but. You know, you hear people say, oh, you was a bastard. I'm like, a bastard? How about me a bastard? Well, so my mama was, I'm like, well, hell, I had a daddy somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so it was little, it was stuff like that that people would say. Yeah. You know, but heck, it, it didn't bother me, but it, it may bother some other people. But, you know, and then they would say, well, you you live better if you have a two-parent parent, if you was raised in a two-parent uh, family. I was like. I know some people lived in two parent families and they were, were, were raised worse than I was. I'm like, I ain't had no problem. I said, we ain't want for nothing. Like, we didn't think we were poor. Uh, you know, we knew we, you know, we, we had food, we had roof over our head. We had plenty of food. We never wanted for anything. So I don't know what y'all talking about. Yeah. You know, so it was, you know, it was, well, yeah, because back in the, you know, they didn't say anything. Like I said, they, I knew I had a daddy somewhere, but. Oh, nobody never said anything, and we didn't. We didn't ask. And like I tell people, I said Uncle Bernard to me was my was my dad. You know, him and you know my all my mama's brothers because they they helped my mama to raise us. So you know, I didn't miss no men being in my life because we had all of those all um, mom. You know, so they you know they kind of helped my mom as I remember. They kind of helped my mom raise us. So I guess that's why we didn't miss nothing like that. We didn't miss no man in your life. We had men. We had men in our life. We had our uncle. As our parents now, that they have learned a lot and they can manage motherhood. What's interesting is that you've said a few times about your own mama. My mama told me this. Yeah. I remember my mama told me this. Yeah. So do you have any things in your mind of some of the things that you've said to your own daughters or grandchildren? They're going to say, my mama told me this. Is there one thing that stands to your mind? And they're going to say, mama always told me this. My mama always told Meaning me Meaning you. You're the mama telling them. What are you going to, because they're going to think back. It's like you were so adamant. My mama told me this. Is there some mama told me moment that you can think about your own kids? I would tell them, yeah, that, you know, keep a savings. Do you keep a savings no matter what nobody tells you? Keep a savings of you have a checking account, which is your, if you get married, have your own checking account. Have your own savings account. And don't tell nobody else. Okay, okay. Interesting words of advice. <laughs> so... Now that I think about your own mom, I realize that you also were a caregiver and that you provided caregiving for your father and then to your mother. And now you're even providing caregiving support to your two elderly aunts in their 90s. Can you give us some kind of, guess, just give people who really have not gone through their phase of life where they are taking care of their parents or elderly people in their lives. What can they some, some words of wisdom of what you can advise those people, knowing what to do, what to prepare for emotionally or services. Just, just give them some idea, because I don't think a lot of people realize what it really takes for a person to take care of elderly who are your family members. It is. It's a lot of work. I didn't know. I was still working for the government when I took care of my father. He was the first caregiver 
never in a million years would I ever dream that I had to take care of him. I was kind of mad at first because I felt like my dad didn't come into my life until I was about 13. So I felt like that I shouldn't be the one that had to take care of him. But uh, it was all left on me. Uh, I was the, I'm the youngest of my, for my brothers first, my sister, my brother and my sister. So I was left to do that, but I had to learn how to do it. And because I worked for Social Security, I had a lot of help in, in helping me to find out a lot of stuff about how to take care of elderly. The Social Security really did come in and step in and show me, you know, all the, uh, the benefits, the whatever you need to get, or the, you know, the things that you do, how to get the money, mm -hmm. how to get the, the daycare centers. They showed me, told me all about that and, you know, just doing research. I mean, I worked for judges and they really, really did help me as far as trying to get service for my dad because I had no idea. I didn't even know my dad's social security number. All I knew his name and that was it. And so I had to get used to that and, you know, and then I did took care of him for nine years before he went to um, the nursing home. And that was because I was still working and he needed uh, in-house. He needed mm -hmm. full-time care. Full-time care. And with my mom, it was just great because uh, I had both of my sisters and all my brothers, you know, helping out with my mom, and she was. She was in a better shape than my dad was, so it was easy uh, because I did have, you know, a lot more help than I had with my dad. So, but I tell people, it is a it is a hard job, but as your mom who raised you, brought you through this world, who took care of you, that's our job is to take care of our parents, no matter what the circumstances is. Uh, we just have to. Bite our tongues and just deal with it. And so, I do you say you, bite your tongue because the elderly um, are sometimes angry about their sickness or they're not understanding what what they're saying? What do you mean by that? I think a lot of elderly um, maybe upset, especially if they're so used to being on their own. Uh, for my dad, I think he was angry because as for. I'm his daughter, me taking care of him. He didn't like that part. He just felt like a man should be, I guess, should be taking care of him and not a woman and because I was his daughter. But he got used to me and, and you know, we got along good after that, but it was hard because he felt like that uh, I shouldn't be taking care of him because I'm, I'm the daughter and he's the dad, I guess, or a man, so, but, um, we, we, we managed to get to work through there and um, he had dementia and he would, and he had a stroke so it was much harder for me to try to take care of him as far as my mom because my mom still could do a lot of stuff on her own. My dad could too. He was really a strong man. He did a lot of his, you know, he didn't want people to really depend on him. So he would walk even though he was paralyzed. But he, he loved going to church, and that was one thing that he looked forward to on Sunday morning was going to church. And so, you know, he lived to be 90, 96, I think. Uh -huh. Your children were in the house then? Were they helping you, your children, um, husband at all, helping you? My youngest, Tra Tamika, was in the house, so she helped. I think that's why she decided to go into a uh, physical therapist, because... She saw me taking care of my dad, and she would come in and she would, you know, try to help. So I think that that was an encouragement also because I tried to teach both of them to, you know, to do for others. You know, there's less fortune, like when foster care, I did the foster care thing. So, uh, so they learned by, you know, they kept, both of them learned by helping others. Because they saw what I did in, in trying to help other, other other people and other kids. Well, you clearly have an open heart, even with the 
the current day where you're helping out, it takes a village, as we say, but you're helping out even with the two elderly aunts, you're doing caregiving, mm -hmm. where other people can say, that's not my, my, my issue, I don't have to, you're jumping in to be a support, you and your other family members. So that's uh, it's incredible for all of us. Now, I see how energetic and active and you're very nutrition focused. You also started your own business. Can you share, share a little bit about your own business that you started? Oh, when I retired from the federal government and one day I was just sitting down and I'm like, man, I want to do, be a personal trainer. So I got on a computer and started fooling around with the computer and put in personal trainer. I wanted to go, I wanted to be a personal trainer because um, I, I love exercising, I enjoy it, and I would teach classes at, the, at my church and for other people, so I decided that I wanted to really go back to school and learn what it takes to be a personal trainer and learn about our body and how it works. So I went online, I researched, and then they had some, you know, you had to do online, you can take classes online. I didn't want an online class, I wanted a hands-on class. So as soon as I put my information in, check! came back, the computer came back and says a class in Manassas. So I signed up for that class and they did all my paperwork and I went to school for a year and got my license and certification in um, a personal trainer. So that's how that, that, that story came about. So you're now, uh, you're a woman owned small business and you're, you're primarily the person doing all that work. What were the challenges that you found when you had to start your business? You got your license and certification, but now you're starting to be an entrepreneur. What are some of the challenges you face as an uh, African-American female entrepreneur here in uh, the Northern Virginia area? I don't think I have any challenges um, because most of my customers or clients are word of mouth, and I don't charge a lot because I, I enjoy doing it, and most of my clients are mostly older seniors, you know, 50, 55. I've had some young clients, but most of them are seniors and I enjoy working with them because they are the one who needs it and it's just company for them and I can uh, go to their home and talk to them and pull out all of their equipment that they have at home and we'll just sit down and talk and we start exercising. So, and it's company for them, so that's why I enjoy doing, uh, working with the seniors. Another big move as a senior, you're about to relocate to Florida. Yeah. How is that? Getting ready to change. You've been a resident of this state for all of your life primarily. So what is it going to be like to move from here to Florida? I don't think it's going to be hard. I just think that it's just a different state, a different environment. But I think it's still going to be, you know, I'll still do my physical therapist, I mean my personal training because that's what I like doing. And I know that I already have some clients there waiting for me to come to Florida to exercise them and, you know, do whatever, uh, whatever most of the seniors want. They want somebody to walk with them, they want somebody to go in the pool with them. I'm there to help them to do whatever they want to do and just encourage them because I think our seniors need that encouragement. Not only the seniors, but young folks need that encouragement to exercise and, and get started, you know, changing the way they eat. And, uh, it's just, I'm, I'm excited going to Florida because then I can start out helping somebody else in another state. So, so you're starting out new with your business, your home, already have clients. Ready for the weather, everything, everything. That's wonderful. Um, how, you know, I know that you are a Christian. How has your faith sustained you through 73 years and a lot of things that you've just talked about? You've had medical crisis, you have children, business, your parents, uh, both of them passing. What, how has your faith really helped you and what's gone on in your life? It has really helped me. It has made me strong, it has encouraged me no matter what you're going through. Uh, my mom, my grandma, Pastor Smith will always say, you know, when you're going through a hard time, you know, you can pray. And that's basically what I have been doing, you know, in my rough times in life. I just pray to the good Lord to just keep me strong, keep me through, keep my in my sanity. 
in my right mind. So prayer has really, really helped me a lot. When nobody else knows, you can always pray. You know, um, as we think about our life's end, um, do you have things in your mind that you want people to say about you? When they think about Joyce Fay, what are some things you want people to think about you or remember about you? Um, it really doesn't matter what people say about me because I know who I am and whose I am. And so I tell people that uh, I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. And no matter what you can say to somebody, if they've already made up their mind to judge you or feel you, you know, they've already made up their mind, so I can't change that. So I just tell people, I know that I'm a good person. Uh, I love people. I enjoy talking to folks. Um, so I'm just, you know, just to say that I live my life to the fullest. That's what I want people to remember me about and that I try to help as many as I could. But I'm going to enjoy my life. So who would you like to dedicate your family episode to? You think of whoever you want to dedicate this episode to. I think I need to dedicate to all the family because everybody needs uh, to have, to want to have being good health. That's one thing, you know, so to me, to dedicate just to one person, I just think every person needs to know that they that they can live a long life and a prosper life. They just trust and believe in God and keep the faith, and that they can make. It. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time.